Hello, dear friends. We're happy to greet you again. And today we're going to talk to the esteemed Igor Mikhailovich Danilov. Greetings. Igor Mikhailovich, I would like to begin our today's meeting with the topic of Islam and the Hadith, which our viewers have shared. In Islam, in the Hadith, it is said that an angel will not enter a house where there are images. It is also said that on the day of resurrection, the harshest punishment will befall those who created these images, and severe torments await them on the day of judgment. In this regard, our viewers ask the following question. Which images were meant exactly, and what house did the Prophet talk about? Well, this conversation is a continuation of our series about images, right? Yes, the subject is extensive and broad. I understand. As a matter of fact, everything is simple, friends. There is the only house that a person can build for God. It is inside himself. Whatever beautiful buildings we erect, whatever we call them, that it is a house of God and the like, a house of God cannot exist in the material world. It just cannot. But when God's love arises in us, when we give our love to the spiritual world and already receive a response, this is exactly what creates a house where God settles. You see, that's what may be called the house of God. A temple not made with hands. Have you heard about it? Yes, sure. Right. It's the only temple you can build. Well, everything else, well, I understand religions, traditions. Well, let me put it simply. The only temple we can build is ourselves. I mean the temple for God. If we open the door for God in it and God settles there, this is really our merit. Yet, no matter what we use, wood, stone, or whatever else, for erecting any buildings, and no matter what we call them and how we decorate them, those are merely premises for, well, how to put it, for our communication, nothing more. Can that really be a house of God? Does God really live, so to say, within stone walls, in the material and inevitably dead world, the eternally alive God? Of course not. And can God actually be in our body? A simple question. No. But nevertheless, in us as in our body, both the physical and the energy one, in the structure, no matter what we call it, in our energy structure, when love is generated in us, really generated by us, then the living love comes in response. And here, yes, a house of God is formed. So everything is very simple indeed. And this question is good, that when you have images in your house, an angel will not enter it. Yes. Well, guys, it's very simple here too. How can an angel enter where there is no longer a place for it? Can an angel really enter a house where Satan lives? It cannot. Well, what is an image? An image is an illusion that the devil has created, and it lives there. So when we create an illusion, we nourish it and waste our life. After all, we do not spend our life on God's love, on our contact with the spiritual world. We spend our life, our time, our energy on the inevitably, not even dead, but something that definitely doesn't exist, on an image. As you once said, images are shadows. Yes, these are shadows from the light that distort the truth. And can the light, pure, genuine light, flow into where there is something that distorts it, where shadows predominate? A simple question. Of course it cannot, friends. That is why we already spoke a lot about images, about what they are and how they live. Let's just put it simply. Let's try to explain once again that, as the ancients used to say, God allotted every human with a lifespan of at least 1500 years. And the ancients wondered why people live such a short period of time. The answer was simply amazing. 
God, He is very kind and generous, and He endows us with everything, a long life, a very long one, as well as happiness, joy and health. He endows us with everything. Yet why do we have it that way? Why do we live a short period of time? Why do we fall ill? Why do we not have peace, happiness and joy? That's a good question, isn't it? We have a wrong lifestyle. What do you mean by a wrong lifestyle? Should we properly eat, get enough sleep, have rest, somehow love ourselves, take care of ourselves and somehow exploit our body carefully? Psycho-emotional state. Well, psycho-emotional state, we should be satisfied with everything, right? And again, our psycho-emotional state depends on external factors, doesn't it? It does. For instance, if we are surrounded by a good, wonderful team where we feel good, or in a family where we respect one another, where everything is splendid, where everyone takes care of each other, and everything is wonderful, right? That's the way it should be. Yet, have any of you seen such perfect conditions in real life? There is nothing perfect in this system, indeed. Absolutely right. Yes. Now, we already… It's already deformed, a priori. Literally fantasize, why? If a family, let's say, consists even of three people, and if they do not engage in their own spiritual development and have not achieved any results yet, they cannot be perfect, just cannot be. Why? Because they have images, they have emotions, they get irritated, they fight for being the Alpha. There is confrontation and everything else all the time, just like in any group, in the literal sense of the word. Even a child tries to dominate and fight for our attention, the attention of adults. This is already an attraction of attention, even if we understand everything. We pay attention to him, we know exactly as much as his imp is supposed to have, so it grows. And so on, I mean we are literate, intelligent and spiritually mature, while a child is unstable. He's already unstable. He already creates a lot of provocations. And he lives by images. Does anyone teach our children to properly develop? Nobody teaches them that in the consumerist format. This is really so. A child is left guideless, isn't he? So he tries to freely fantasize, especially during the first five or six years before the primary search. It is even pointless to do anything let's say, to educate, not pointless, no. We should actually educate, we should tell, explain, and so on. A person should awaken spiritually, however, a child doesn't feel himself as a personality. During the initial term, personality really associates itself with consciousness, and it can maturely separate itself, let's say, already closer to the secondary surge or after it. Thus, a person makes a final choice on how he should live either with God or with the devil, already closer to the secondary search, well, approximately at that time. Does it mean that such, let's say, unprepared children, who do not know the other side, experience and perception through feelings, become more entrenched at the level of consciousness at the moments of the primary and secondary searches? Right, let's just look at how children grow up, okay? After all, they have games and fantasies, they talk to imaginary friends and everything else, so they spend a lot of that, an imagination, which would be useful for us over the years, meaning their lives. On imagination, they create a lot of things. Why? It is exactly secondary consciousness that, while developing, learns to manipulate personality. Everything is very simple. A human is the only being in this world that is able to bring an illusion to life. After all, animals do not and cannot do that. Yes, more developed animals also think by means of images. They have primitive thinking, but they don't have the imagination which humans have. Why? A simple question. Because they don't possess that which really gives life. A human is in some way well, that's wrong. But in some way a human is godlike because there is a part of the spiritual world in him. What we should spend, let's say, on gaining life, we spend on bringing images to life in our heads. No one thinks about that. While in reality, images are not a product of our brain, no. Images are generated in our brain, and we can see them with, say, our inner eyesight, right? Anyone can see them. A simple example, when we fight for dominance in a group, 
and there is some competitor, or we try to win someone, youth, love, and everything else. A boy wins a girl, or a girl wins a boy. What's going on? Constant talking, constant communication Feeding. with the image of that person. Or a dispute arises with someone. Okay, it doesn't matter where you are, friends, at work, at home, in a family, anywhere else. It doesn't matter. You encounter a stronger demon, and the game of imps in your head begins. This microfight is maintained in… Of course. Continuous, yes. Yes, and we prove something, we explain. In other words, in the beginning we create an image of a non-existent person. I'm saying again, there is a specific person, but we create an image of a non-existent person. A phantom. A phantom in the literal sense of the word. It doesn't exist in the material world, but at the same time, it exists in the subtle material world. It really exists. We talk to it, we spend our life energy on it. It lives at our expense. This is extremely beneficial for the system itself. It is beneficial to our consciousness. Why? We pay with our lives for an illusion, don't we? Also, you know, when such scenarios are generated in a person's head, he loses the borderline of where reality is and where this imaginary game of course. and dialogue with the phantom are. And then, surely, certain demands are imposed on that person in real life. Plus, we also become emotionally upset. We do. Why? When we meet a real person, we have already built a conversation. Right. We have already dialogue, and there has to be already a result. While well, everything goes wrong. Why? Relationships are built in the head, which of course. definitely do not correspond in reality. Do not correspond. And they never will. Why? Because we face a demon of equal strength. Yes. Or even stronger. Right? Well, if we use the language of religion and call consciousness, a demon or a shaitan, it doesn't matter. Isn't that so? And look what's interesting in this case. If our demon is stronger, while the one of our interlocutor is weaker, then everything will develop practically the way we planned it all. Who hasn't noticed that? That's exactly the result. So, if we have learned to observe, as an observer even from the position of primary consciousness, or even better, from the position of personality, when we already have a certain degree of freedom, we notice all these patterns. We notice the game of our consciousness, we notice what phantom images in our heads are. And that's when we clearly understand why an angel cannot be born. In other words, we cannot become an angel if we work for Satan. That's unrealistic. Moreover, we waste our own lives. And that's where the answer is hidden. Even the ancients said that we spend what is alive on our illusions by creating inevitably dead things. And then, excuse me, we live such a short period of time that sometimes we do not have time to do something for ourselves here. But that's our fault. Yes, Igor Mikhailovich. And there is also the following question. For example, a person has created some images for himself and he understands that this is bad. Guys ask the following question. Is it possible to get rid of this image completely? Is it possible to simply erase it from memory, from consciousness, forever? To format it as a memory. Yes, to format it. It is possible to format memory. We understand that it takes time to get rid of an active, strong image of, let's say, the phantom which you have created and which already dominates you. In order to get rid of it, you need time and effort. But the question is whether you'll get rid of it forever or not. Of course you won't. You can deactivate it. However, you cannot eliminate it completely. And it will still exist and will still eat your life. But not as actively as it ate when it was active, right? Yet, what did it eat? It ate a person, the one who created it. Therefore, my friends, you know, the main thing is not to be a meal, even for your own imagination. And everything will be fine, right? Right. Well, that's how it is with the images. You do not notice how you become a dumpling. So, it is possible to format memory, but you'll never get rid of an image, the one that you created. And you will be feeding it exactly as long as you exist in the body here. 
and your prana or life energy, let's say, will be distributed to this image as well. The question is whether it will be active or inactive. Well, some people will say, that's unrealistic, it is possible to get rid of it. What are you telling us, my friends? In this case, we are telling absolute facts that have been confirmed by numerous experiments. Do you doubt it? Experiment. All you need is a good hypnotist, your consent, and you will see how many things will pop up even from your childhood. Merely that. Do the images which a child creates disappear anywhere? No, they grow up together with him. And this way we give rise to a legion of those who live instead of us. That is why, out of the 1500 years which we are supposed to live, we live for a very short period of time, because so many entities live instead of us. You know, thanks to your explanations, and you once said that images are like a certain program or a certain file on a computer. Surely, of course. And that even… This is also the case. There is a file, no matter what you do. You write a poem or draw a picture in the computer. You turn the computer off, but the file is stored. Why? Owing to what? Owing to the energy that is stored there, right? Does the file consume energy? It does. If it doesn't consume energy, it will simply disappear. But it doesn't disappear. Another kind of energy. Of course. What is the difference? Energy is energy, yes, it has, let's say… But the file is there, yes. Of course, it is there. Until electricity… Until it is there. Is connected and you unzip the file by your choice. Right. And if we again, as you say, by our own choice, connect the energy to that image, it again becomes… Active. Active. You can and should deactivate it. Images should not predominate in people's minds because they are very, very harmful. That is why Islam explicitly speaks about that and quite a lot. And Prophet Muhammad paid a lot of attention to that. But what happened? How people went ahead and perverted it? Having the understanding that there shouldn't be images in a house, for an angel to enter, people simply remove all sorts of images, pictures, or something else from their homes. Well, my friends, it is always this way in our world. Everything internal, which relates to spiritual awakening and growth, is all shifted into some material plane. We can do that in our external life as much as we like, to remove all pictures, TV sets and everything else, even not to use the phone. We can do it in order to attain paradise, can't we? Yes. But what is inside us, we perceive as our own, and we don't understand that what the Great Ones told us and what really takes away our lives is a banal picture, it is what we live by and not what we hang on the wall. Because if it is not hanging on the wall, or if a person removes various external impressive images, then most likely consciousness attacks him with all its force inside him. Inside him. 100%. It intensifies and pressure even more. That's where it all originated, you see. There is also another question, Igor Mikhailovich. When a person follows the spiritual path, his inner transformation, inner transfiguration takes place, a tremendous power of the soul unfolds and Many people say that a person begins to see the genuine reality and comes across spiritual vision. In this regard, there is a question that is often addressed to us. What is spiritual vision? And how to understand that I already have it? Here is a very… How spiritual am I, right? Yes, exactly. It's a frequent question, friends. Do I have the spiritual vision or not? This is where people also become confused quite often at that. There is a concept of inner eyesight, okay? That is, we see images and talk to them. It's like… I don't know, you're sitting in a movie theater and there it is. Or you close your eyes and there is a sensation that it is near you. This is our inner eyesight. Whereas spiritual vision is something completely different. In spiritual vision there are no images. So what it is like, it gives clear understanding and knowledge, right? But when people start talking about what they see and so on, it is tried magic. It is actually playing up to the system. Opening of the third eye. Even the tenth eye. Right. You see? 
that's mischief from the system, but thus it leads you astray. So we do not support people talking about that and sharing it. Many of our friends who really practice and follow the spiritual path know that, and we sort of set a taboo for people to share their inner experience, and all the more any extrasensory manifestations or something of that kind. Why? Because it is such a contagious thing for other people. And again, you know, human fantasies, to seem but not to be, and many other things. Well, we all know that some rather weak personalities play with that, so to say. Thus, in order to avoid this kind of mischief and misunderstanding of this matter among people, when they encounter such manifestations on the spiritual path, when shaitan opens the inner eye for them, and a person is able to really see something, people can really see what may be happening somewhere, they can foresee tomorrow. How many of such cases are there? Actually, quite a lot. Or even better, when this often happens as well. And many people told us that they entered a room, sat there for a while, talked, left, and later on somebody told them, you came and my head stopped aching, or you came and we felt so happy and good. It is clear that when a person works on himself, he is a source, of certain powers that he radiates, let's say, divine powers, a lot. Certainly, if he is around, all sorts of things may pass for some people, right? For some people, let's say, even images disappear in their heads in the presence of such a person, while in others, on the contrary, they intensified, the demon becomes even more violent. Activates. Yes? Well, let's say, those are a minority. Most people really feel, let's say, an elevated mood, they feel better, that's normal and natural. But the trouble is that some of our friends begin to consider that it's like a gift from God, you know? They confuse what is sinful with what is righteous. It's not shaitan's tricks, but it's a gift from God. It's a certain stage of spiritual development, and if you don't gain such abilities, most likely you haven't matured enough or the system is not interested in you. That happens too. Yes, yes. in other words, you haven't matured enough to… That happens too. Or they abuse it and turn off the path. Let's say, why does the system give such lures? These are cookies along the road, which… Thanks to these cookies, you know, like a maniac, lures a child, saying, here's a candy or a cookie, come with me, I have toys at home. The system acts in the same way. A person follows the spiritual path, a little part of the road remains ahead of him, he starts maturing, and here the system begins to lure, here are extrasensory abilities for you, and now you can feel people, and here you can understand what they think about, not hear thoughts, but understand. The difference is huge, you see? Plus, see or foresee something, such mischief from the system. Why? Because the system knows what will happen. That's the answer. That's when people have just encountered an initial experience during spiritual practices, and they suddenly approach more experienced people and are even obsessed with that experience. Tell me, is the experience that I encountered already a spiritual vision or not? This is already the first danger that a person craves this magic. Of course. For this very reason, the system hooks them. Why? Because unusual manifestations of some kind are what our consciousness craves. What for? In order to gain a greater individuality, to stand out in the crowd, to excel, to become an alpha. A person has extrasensory abilities, okay. He's already not like anyone else. He can see another person, feel and perceive him, see where and what kind of problem he has with his health, or what thoughts he has, or what his mood is like. That's already sort of interesting, you see. So many people start engaging in spiritual development, among other things, in order to receive this as a gift. In many religions it is also called a gift from God. Wait, is magic really a gift? For saints, magic was a punishment. And for any sane person it's a punishment. It's another trick on the path. Which has distracted you? You have invested your attention. And what does it mean, you have invested your attention? You have given your life to magic. My friend, you won't have enough energy remaining for life. Do you understand the point? It's very simple. Not only do we feed images, we also begin to intensely invest our attention in those illusory manifestations, 
of some unusualness, but what is unusual there? To understand what a person thinks, do you need it? Understand what you think and who instills these thoughts in you. In fact, the one who instills thoughts in another person instills them in you. For the devil, it is certainly easy to ensure that you understand them, to foresee tomorrow. Pardon me if you live as a slave of shaitan. Of course, you will foresee tomorrow. Why? Because you are a slave to shaitan and he knows what you will do tomorrow. But when you are a spiritually free person, Shaitan doesn't know what will happen to you in a moment. Because you are free, he has no power over you. That's what you should strive for. Isn't this what was spoken about? Yes. It was said that all these illusions, all these images, are like clipping the wings of course. for the one who wants to fly up into the spiritual heights. That's right. And instead of becoming an angel and flying up into the sky, you become, excuse me, my friend, like a goose an ordinary domestic goose to whom the system either clips the wings or hangs a brick and you jump and twitch while your destiny is simple. You'll be a lunch for the system itself. Is it worth it? A simple question. Some extraordinary abilities. Do you know what the most valuable and most outstanding thing is? Is to gain life. That's what is the most important. And not the pursuit of magic, although some people definitely spend their whole life on gaining some magic ability or likening themselves to someone. Well, that's actually… Igor Mikhailovich, why was the Prophet against miracles? And basically all the messengers of God… And who? Of course! …treat miracles sort of with misgiving, so to say. Because all the miracles that happen here are performed by Satan. Or a person must possess such spiritual power as to make Satan do something. This is the world of matter. Anything here, well, any movement of, say, one matter to the other side, is energy which is managed by Satan, it is dead matter and not living one, while life belongs to God. Yet a human possesses both life and death at the same time. Only by his own choice a human, as personality, can gain or choose either life or, excuse me, being a subpersonality. He will not die after death. That's the trouble. But he won't become alive either, and that is even worse than if he would die. It's very important to actually track these moments in yourself. As you mentioned, when people meet and say, I felt better in your presence, or my headache passed in your presence after I had been next to you, and such tricks. Well, you know, such things press up on megalomania. Of course. It elevates a person in his own thoughts. Kind of non-contact healing. Yes, I'm a hero. People say, If a person is close to highly spiritual people, he must be like that, right? After all, he is close to the Great Ones, how can he come down to that? In other words, the Great One is supposed to protect him from demons. My friends, we are all people, just people, and everyone is individual. Let's just recall, I don't want let's say, to accuse anyone or something else. Let's just recall history, shall we? There was Jesus Christ who showed something, okay. He restored people's eyesight. He resurrected people. He brought people back to life. Right. What did He say to His disciples? He said, after Me you will do much more than I did. Yes. He said, I merely restored a man's eyesight while you will give people spiritual eyesight. I merely resurrected a dead man, while you will give life to people. That is much greater. And what did some of those who were close to Him and listened to Him do? Let's be honest. How did they exalt themselves? Let's take Simeon. Miracles. Yes, what attracted him? Miracles. The external. And how they promoted it, and how they made people believe that, Even when Simeon walked, if his shadow touched a fatally ill person, the latter would recover. What was, let's say, the greatest thing Jesus Christ did in the three-dimensional world? He resurrected people. And who among the Apostles resurrected the dead? We again find that those were Paul and Peter. Well, one can write whatever they like. You know, paper will tolerate anything. He resurrected the dead. Dead ones do not bring the dead back to life. However, this doesn't apply to medical doctors. They just don't let 
the living body die, nothing more. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Well, in that case, it's already a total likening. Simeon even surpassed in many aspects. Jesus Christ did his best, applied effort somehow, yes. healed or did something else while Simeon just walked. And with his shadow, shadow, can you imagine what a holy man he was and how much power he had? While to us consciousness offers even non-contact healing, not just with a shadow. Well, that too, yes. But simply by our presence. Yet how many, excuse me, let's be honest, okay, our friends were with us, they studied, followed the spiritual path, achieved good results, and then suddenly a gift opened up in them to heal people without contact. And they gained an ability to influence people even through photographs. So where are they? A simple question. Why are they not on the spiritual path? They have turned off the path. You know, it's an acute topic. If it were just one case, you could ignore it, but there is already a whole series of these cases. A person gains power, which he can redirect to other people. But whose power is it? After all, they knew and understood that. But it was so interesting, wasn't it, to become such a powerful mage, when you can influence, when you can restore health and take it away, when it pays well, and when other people, excuse me, are trembling in fear in front of you. Look how tempting it is power. that normal people just got off the way, of the right way. And I have another question. What is their life like now? And now they know it. Almost all of them. Well, more people will join them soon. As an addition, a simple question. It's a pity that we cannot show them so that they themselves tell us we have a taboo on magic. Well, except for that project, right? On studying. On studying magic. Yes. But it's about studying. It has nothing to do with real magic, friends. That's merely a project, a research of how people themselves engage in it. It's not our participants. Our participants study magic in the shadow control in order for those who are people of the first type, it's hard for them to come to the understanding that there is something different. So through science and research, they come to realize that there is something, right? And when they get their consciousness stumped by the facts, they say, here's one man doing it, and another man doing it. Since there is magic, it means there is the devil. Right. If there is the devil, it means there is God. This way, some people also manage to embark on the right path, the spiritual path. Another thing, Ingrid Mikhailovich, besides magic, we observe the following phenomenon, that when guys embark on the spiritual path, they immediately want to take more powerful tools. And when you ask them, why don't you do autogenic training, for example? Why don't you start with that? Why do you take the pyramid practice right away? They say, maybe if we take a stronger tool, we'll be able to break away from the shackles of the system faster. To break away faster, right. Yes. What comes into play here again? Megalomania, overconfidence. But megalomania and overconfidence are the tools of Satan, who holds people and pushes them to do that. And it turns out that people, having neither practice nor experience, take up the tools that they cannot use, Afterwards, consciousness itself tells them, come on, you do not succeed in anything, either the tools are wrong or something is wrong with you. It's a rare case when something is wrong with you. Usually the tools are wrong while you are right, isn't it so? And the entire attention is focused precisely on the fact that you do not succeed, you just don't succeed in the pyramid practice. How can you succeed in it? Well, let's imagine a simple example, my friends. Imagine a gym, a boxing class. A beginner comes to the gym, he has never been in a ring and has never even put gloves on. He puts gloves on for the first time and says, why learn anything? It's easy. Here are the gloves, here's a sparring partner, that's it. Hit him, and that's all. Hit him harder and don't be shy. And let's go sparring with a champion right away. Isn't that so? And what will be the result? A simple question. You know, I'll give you… Friends, I'll share a personal example from my life. We used to do sports. 
at a sports complex. We engaged in certain kinds of sports, while next to us there were weightlifters. I was already a candidate for Master of Sports at that time, while weightlifters were young people, sportsmen of various classes, and they were pulling weights. And all of a sudden, an idea came. Why don't we lift weights? So we went there. Bravado. Why on earth did we go there? Yes, bravado. If those guys can lift such weights, won't we be able to lift them? I did lift, but I almost tore all my ligaments. Excuse me. A beginner sportsman who had been weightlifting for only about five years could lift it, while I already had a profound experience in sports. He could easily lift the weight which almost broke me down in the literal sense of the word. Why did it happen this way? A simple question. Because sometimes it takes years. Because I practiced a different kind of sport. Yes, exactly. You see, I am not physically prepared to lift this kind of weight. I don't have a weightlifting technique. In sports there are subtleties everywhere. And these subtleties are extremely important, friends. So you shouldn't do anything stupid. Take an example of what is the right thing to do, and you shouldn't do what is wrong. I did the wrong thing back then. Igor Mikhailovich, some people say, okay, I don't succeed when I perform it individually. Right. Still, let's take that very pyramid practice. Maybe during meetings with friends, let's say, in a group practice, I will succeed more. And suddenly you face the fact that these expectations of yours do not come true. It seemed to you that you could synchronize with everyone, yet you cannot do that. Wait, what does it mean to synchronize with everyone? When performing spiritual and meditative practices, meaning practices like the pyramid, the chitvarik. Yes, the chitvarik, when, for instance, 10 or even 500 people, doesn't matter, gather, in one fairly cramped room and start performing these practices. And sometimes it is necessary, friends, what for? In order to understand how it is performed, technically. However, you will not succeed in performing this practice correctly. These are individual practices, you see? I mean, when there are quite many of us in a room, and the room is fairly cramped, it turns out that we just overlap with each other, at the energy level. Will anything work out? It won't, you know. I would also compare it with… I beg your pardon for the comparison, but it would be very accurate. Imagine that, let's say, 20 of us come into a room, it doesn't matter, and we are given violins and bows, and a coach or, say, a music teacher tells us, play the note A in sync. Will we play it in sync if we are holding violins and bows in our hands for the first time? What is A? Yes, and what is… And where can we get it? And actually, yes, play the A. Exactly. Okay, we'll play it. Where is it, right? Right. Isn't that so? Meanwhile, we are required to do that, and precisely in sync. My friends, you know, the spiritual path is simple. It is really very simple, and it is beautiful. But it requires discipline and restraining once shaitan, at least a little bit, so that he doesn't impose nonsense on our minds. You shouldn't put the cart before the horse, honestly. Why? Because if a person is unprepared, if he doesn't know and isn't skilled in techniques, it is pointless to take up serious practices, even meditative practices, not to mention spiritual ones. In other words, you won't learn anything. You simply cannot do it physically. It's unrealistic, isn't that so? It is. Should everyone perform the pyramid practice on the spiritual path? Again, the pyramid. It has been written and told about. Yes. Both the pyramid and the chatwarik are individual practices. They are necessary for those who do not just embark on the spiritual path, but who intend to go further in serving the spiritual world. That is, despite gaining life here, in this world, a person remains to serve the spiritual world. But you know, frankly speaking, this is a rare phenomenon. Few people can do that. And it's an even rarer case when a person is indeed determined and he's already preparing himself for the service to the spiritual world. He really stands firm. That's who needs this practice. What does he need this practice for? 
It's a subtle tool that he can use, let's say, from the other side of this world, you see, in order to become that very tough knot and divert those unnecessary forces to himself as much as possible, so that the grapes would be more intact, so that they live and ripen, ripen. until they themselves become knots, you see? Right. That's the point. Well, in our case, you know how consciousness says, I'm a hero, I can do it now, this way I'll come somewhere faster. Well, let me put it simply, do these practices help? Or is it possible to reach the spiritual world without them? Of course it is possible. Guys, you can do it without any meditations, without any prayers, without anything, just through generation of love. Do you know how many people have achieved that? And I'll tell you even more. Literally, six thousand years ago, there were no practices, they didn't exist. Why would they be needed? A person was born, he learned what love is and how to love God, he was told about that. Plus, he was surrounded by proper working signs, and he knew every sign. You know, it was in people's blood, it was the human essence. But later on, everything changed. And for six thousand years, we've been forgetting it all and degrading. And the further we go, the harder and worse it gets, doesn't it? It does. So nowadays, when a person is, you know, unprepared and doesn't know anything, moreover, due to the information he received from various religions, even if he was in search of how to really attain life during lifetime, so to say, here, he comes across techniques which, well, you know, I would draw the following association. It's like, there are very hungry people, they want to eat, they see food and smell it, but they cannot reach it. Why? It is behind the glass. And a person cannot move away either, because there is no food anywhere else. Well, here he sees it, but he cannot take it. It's a simple point, isn't it? So why drive yourself into the situation? When you smell and see that another person is doing something, you understand he can do that. While you fail to do that, you know, it actually destabilizes, the system begins to play on that. I mean, guys, everything should go according to a plan, then everything will work out. Although, I'm telling you, it's not a criterion. Again, let's take a simple example. Many people begin to synchronize themselves in performing lotus. I understand it when it comes to alat. Yes. With alat, yes. What is the difference between lotus and alat? And is it possible to synchronize in alat and in lotus? It is possible and necessary. In alat, this is. Alat is actually for everyone. What is alat? Let's say, if we describe it associatively, it is when a person generates love and renounces Satan, thus he reduces Satan's power in this world. And if he can generate love, then during this time, not only does he reduce Satan's power, but also he makes him weaker, so to say. Let's imagine there is a drought, severe drought, and there is a lake. We jump into this lake, meaning into the pure waters. Before that we were thirsty and hot, now we ourselves feel pleasant and good. But in addition, we take this moisture to dry land. When we jump into this lake, you know, there are splashes, they fall on the land, this is good, useful and pleasant. Excuse me for such a comparison. It is, let's say, too shallow to show the significance of Alad when a mass of people perform it. Well, it's really good. I also remember it weakens Satan. you said that it is when we all together go ahead and tell him to get lost, we turn away from Satan. Well, in civilized terms, we turn away from Satan, right? right? Or to put it simply, we go ahead and tell him to get lost. Not in words, but in deeds, you see? That's exactly, that's what it is, at least for a while. This is really good. And what is lotus? Lotus is a very serious practice, it's a spiritual practice, although it begins simply as autogenic training. Right. A person goes through all stages, autogenic training, meditation and spiritual practice, and up to infinity. Is it possible to synchronize it? It's impossible. Just impossible is an individual practice. But why is it performed in groups, and it really has a tremendous effect? Yet again, when does it work? It works when everyone is attuned to work, when everyone really strives and desires. Then yes, everyone dives to their own depth. Again, why dives, friends? From time immemorial, the spiritual world, the other world, has been compared to waters. 
After all, we are land animals, we are not fish, we live on Earth. And for us, the other world is water. In the understanding of our everyday life, for this very reason, that world was associatively compared to water. And just imagine you dive into the ocean, holding your breath, so to say, because you will have to come back to the surface anyway. Someone can dive a meter deep, someone can dive two meters, someone can go even deeper. Well, at the beginning of our journey, we actually only approach this ocean and start having an intention, right? We feel its moisture, we smell it, we simply enjoy even being close to the ocean. If it attracts us and we only want to enter it, there's already an intention to embark on the spiritual path, isn't it? Thus, what do we slightly do? We walk into the water. We walk into the water and dip our feet into it. Right. We feel the cool water, the entire delight of this water, is exactly the same in Lotus. Everything goes in stages, gradually. Then we go in, immerse entirely near the shore, then dive further and deeper, going down to the depths, right? And then we learn to dive deeply, get priceless pearls, and bring them into this world, from that world. But that's already afterwards. It's when a group is diving, right? I mean, let's imagine a group of swimmers, okay, or pearl divers. There are those who get pearls, and there are those who learn to do it. That's where group classes are extremely important and valuable, right? Everyone dives individually. Not everyone is on the same note, or at the same depth, let's say. Everyone is individual. Someone immerses deeper while you cannot immerse. But Lotus always radiates. It is always full of energy. It is always full of life in those who perform it nearby, and it's impossible not to feel it. You know, it's like a road, it guides and beckons. And indeed, you immerse into the beautiful waters of the ocean while you look, someone goes deeper. You understand that the other world, more marvelous and beautiful, opens for him. There is more happiness and more joy there. So naturally, you long for it with all your strength. You are short of air, but you long for it. And every time you go deeper and deeper. However, we have to be honest because sometimes it happens otherwise. When there is an experienced diver who dove more than once and already brought more than one bucket of pearls, but it is life, he's a feather brain or something else, you know, like friends helped him, anything can happen. And he's like tied around with foam plastic, okay? He tries to dive, but wobbles on the waves in the wind. The ocean is beneath him. He goes into practice but cannot immerse. Why? Foam plastic doesn't let him. Whereas foam plastic is all our images, thoughts and everything else. That also happens. And there is a difference here too. If a swimmer is experienced and really strives for God, really strives into love, what does he do? He continues to struggle. Continues. Continues, Tatiana said, that's right. Eventually, he's in the ocean waters. The ropes become wet and loose, the person becomes slick, so he struggles and breaks away. The foam plastic remains on top while he goes to the depths. Yet there are other situations when a person is less experienced and when he encounters that, he becomes even more entangled and cannot immerse. That happens, he needs time for these ropes to decay and foam plastic to come off him. Such situations happen too, so Lotus is a very deep and serious spiritual practice indeed. And group performance of this practice is very valuable, right. because, as you once said, there are those who create this excitement of immersion. Of course. Just recently you were standing ashore. You were only thinking. You were thinking whether you should enter. You saw somebody diving, but when you see that happiness and delight which they present afterwards, when they emerge and they give it to people, well, and when you feel it, when you know it, you just cannot stand ashore. Everyone dives. However, there are also such people, especially, you know, when a group is just forming, they haven't achieved harmony in work, and somebody begins to ask questions, why do you need pearls? Sometimes it happens that they are about to dive while somebody has totally earthly intentions and then everything is disturbed. He instills certain doubts. Surely, those who can dive, they dive deeply, while others, those who are only about to approach the ocean or wet their feet, someone among them starts asking, why are you doing that? 
However, at the depth, the voice of doubts isn't heard. It is not. As soon as a person dives headlong, Satan's power disappears. That's what is amazing about lotus. Do you know what it is like? If someone has diving experience, and even more so if they dove into depth, it is noisy on the beach, kids are screaming, but it's enough to dive, and sounds become completely different, everything changes, even if you don't dive very deep. But when you dive even deeper, everything becomes entirely different. The spiritual practice of the white lotus is beautiful. They named it the white lotus exactly, because there isn't any filth, it grows from a swamp, passes through dirty waters, and before the sun there appears a snow-white flower, absorbing precisely the sunlight and showing itself in all its purity, and no matter how you smudge it, filth doesn't stick to it. That is the effect of the lotus, that's the point. Thus, by association with this flower, this practice was actually named. Although we mentioned that there are other practices too, for instance, that very circle practice, we will talk about it sometime. It is also interesting. While everything begins simply with love, friends, with an intention, if you have merely felt or understood that the ocean exists, not to mention you have seen it or something else, it's enough to understand that it exists and you aspire to it, then, if you truly aspire, if you feel that you are a human being, if you do your best, you will certainly, definitely discover the entire beauty of this ocean. If a person really wants it, it's impossible not to gain life, unless you lose to Satan, unless you go astray. But in order not to stray from this path, my friends, there is a very reliable and accurate navigator, it is love. In fact, if a human, let's say, feels this need inside him, just like the need for service, right? If a person feels the need to share happiness and joy, to share his insights, and to really serve the spiritual world, nothing will stop him. Isn't that so? It is. Despite all the difficulties that we have now, we still find time and overcome a lot, believe me, just to communicate with you, right? This is exactly what true love is. That's right. We don't need anything from you, friend. But I tell you sincerely, we simply share our love with you. Let's just share this love with each other, despite all our difficulties, despite all the problems that Shaitan creates in this world. That's what he is needed here for, to make our life more difficult, you know, to make it so unbearable at times that you want to escape. So if it feels like you want to escape, let's escape into life, not into death. Or, on the contrary, shaitan tempts, making your life so sweet that you can stick in it like a fly. And understanding this, friends, let's actually choose not a spoon of honey smeared on the table, but the boundless ocean of life. And for that, friends, we should just love each other. We should start with a simple thing. Let's start with a simple thing, simply with loving each other. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you for the love. Thank you, friends. Thank you for being there. And I thank all those who are genuine and faithful, who, despite the awakening of magic, multiple images and desires remain faithful and honest before God and walk steadfastly along the straight path. Thank you, friends. Thank you for being there.